In this episode, we're tasting Plantation OFTD Overproof Rum, created by an unprecedented collaboration of seven rum geeks, headed by Maison Ferrand owner and master blender Alexandre Gabriel, along with spirits historian Dave Wondrich, Martin Kate of Smuggler's Cove, Paul McFadden of Trailer Happiness, Paul McGee of Lost Lake, Scotty Shooter of Dirty Dick, and today's special guest, Jeff Beach Bumberry of Latitude 29. OFTD was awarded the Chairman's Trophy from Ultimate Spirits Challenge and Drinks International ranked Plantation number one top trending rum, number two bartender's choice, number three best selling rum, and number three best rum in a Mai Tai. Cheers to OFTD. And here we go with our show. Welcome to the Cocktail Guru Podcast. A show about food, drink, and entertainment. With a tight focus on the good life. And all things delicious, luxurious, and fun. I'm Jonathan Pogash, bartender, author, and the host of Cocktails the Grand Tour. And I'm Jeffrey Pogash, wine and spirits professional, author, insatiable collector of culinary ephemera, and so people tell me, an engaging raconteur. And my dad... Very exciting, tiki-filled episode of the Cocktail Guru podcast, I have to say, Dad. I could not be happier. This is my dream come true. It really is. You literally, every single night of your life, have dreamed of, or have dreamt of tiki and... And And of this interview in particular. And of this interview and of the drinks that we're drinking right now because they're made with a lovely uh, product. Yes, I Uh, have my... Yes, I have my plantation overproof OFTD right here, mixed with some delicious Pierre Ferrand dry Curacao. Oh, oh, hey, lovely! Yes. And and this so I have the, the, the combination. What a what a special bottling that this is because all of it, it really so is. many actually literally many hands <laughs> went into making this, including our next guest. But other other than that, you know, Dave Wondrich and um, Paul McGee and Martin Kate, and uh, of course our next guest. But I have a hurricane. I have a hurricane that I kind of made here, a modified, a little modified hurricane. I'm going to have a little sip. Mm. Mm. Oh my goodness! This no- is still, there's nothing better than overproof rum. I'll tell you. That. Yeah, I know. Same, but there's uh, you know this is nowhere near the the hurricane that is is made at the bar of our next guest, um, Latitude Twenty Nine, and. Here, here's here's a little intro um, that dad are you gonna you're gonna do this intro right I am <laughs> okay go please and, go and ahead say whatever go. you were going to say no but I want I'm gonna say do the intro <laughs> well I'll do it because we have a very special guest we have never well he describes himself as a professional bum and I must say we have never in our podcast history so far interviewed a bum. We, professional we are, or otherwise. We are bums. Um, well, I guess we are. But he is the consummate bum because he's a beach bum. And he's probably the best in the business. And honestly, this is a topic that we have not discussed in any depth at all. And it's about time that we talk about tiki cocktails and tiki culture and all things tiki because, you know, that's one of the reasons why we wear these shirts Jonathan and I always have a tiki shirt for that's every true. podcast. It's not just for this one. It's for every podcast. That's true. And that's because we admire and love the tiki culture so much. And as we go along, we'll, we'll show you why. But our bum is a beach bum, and tiki cocktails and tiki culture in general is the subject at hand. And there's nobody more qualified or better at leading us through the wondrous, colorful, and delicious fantasy world of tiki than the world's foremost expert on the subject, Jeff Beachbum Berry. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Hey, Beachbum Berry. Wow, thank you for, for <laughs> taking the time to do this. This really is a g- dream come true. Well, me. I'm very happy to do it. it, not just because we're talking about our favorite subject, but because Jonathan, um, my wife, Anine, and I, alias Mrs. Bum, still remember very fondly the first time we met you back in 2005 at Tales of the Cocktail, and you treated us to a three-and-a-half-hour breakfast at Brennan's, mm. and it was just a 
delightful to meet you. You're one of the first people we met in the cocktail world, and we couldn't have had a better introduction to that whole crowd. Wow. So it's hap- I'm, I'm very happy to be back talking to you again, and to you, Jonathan, as well. This, th- thank you, thank you. Um, yes, I know that you you and my father go way back, and and mm-hmm. I, I don't, and and you and I go back quite a little while. But before before we get into um, the 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 crux of our conversation today i wanted to ask you as we ask all of our guests on our podcast on the cocktail guru podcast uh what is your stranded on desert island cocktail well that would be a navy grog uh that's always been Mm -hmm. either that or a raised mistake but they still won't tell me how they make it over at the tiki tea so Mm -hmm. (laughs) i'm gonna have to go with navy grog because at least i know how to make one of those we had that didn't we john at at tiki tea yeah i think we did yeah. yeah, I've been trying to crack that recipe for decades now. No closer mm-hmm. now than I was back then. Well, we're gonna we're gonna get into that the fact that you are a resurrectionist Ooh, of cocktails, wow. of think cocktails that we some of us thought might have been lost to the ages. But I do have to go back a little bit and start talking to you about the beginning, the beginning which would go back to your childhood, because I think you like me, uh, was greatly influenced by a restaurant experience that you had with your parents. Absolutely. Uh, This is back when snakes walked and dinosaurs still ruled the earth. I'm talking about (laughs) Mm -hmm. 64, maybe? Um, Mm -hmm. I was about six, maybe it was a little later. Um, My parents, being from Brooklyn and the Bronx, the food of my people is Chinese food. And they had moved out to Los Angeles <laughs> into the San Fernando Valley. And they liked to go to Chinese places, Cantonese food. Um, at that time, the um, Cantonese restaurants in the area had figured out that all of these really high-end white tablecloth Polynesian-themed places like Trader Vic's and the Luau and Don the Beachcomber were charging um, really high prices for basic Cantonese dishes, which they would just rename something exotic. So the Cantonese restaurants tried to grab that market share by kickifying their restaurants. And they uh, went all out on Polynesian decor, hired a bartender who knew how to make these kind of tropical drinks, and then they cashed in on the trend. The place that they took me to that did that was called Ah Fong. It was on Ventura Boulevard in Encino, for anybody who's familiar mm-hmm. with San Fernando Valley. And uh, in order to get into the restaurant, you had to walk through the bar. And um, I later found out, like 20 years later, that Ah Fong's, when I went into it, had only two years before been a place called the Bora Bora Room. Uh, it was a Polynesian restaurant that had spent so much money on decor um, that they went out of, they couldn't recoup their investment and they went out of business. <laughs> and uh, a local Chinese restaurateur, uh, Benson Fong, who some people even older than me might remember as a character actor, he played Charlie Chan's number one son in that series. Uh, yes, He was yes. in uh, Herbie the Love Bug and some other movies. But he had a chain of Chinese restaurants, and he basically hermit crabbed into the Bora Bora Room, which had already been completely kitted out um, and, and totally tiki-fied. So that was the restaurant my parents took me to. Um, you had to walk through the bar to get into the dining room. So even though I was way too young to drink, I saw the bar, and it made – a lasting impression on me. Some might say it ruined my life. (laughs) Um, The bar had um, not only an outrigger canoe hanging from the ceiling, and even the carpeting was done up in a Polynesian print. Um, There were all kinds of carvings on the wall. Most impressive for me, even though I, I just saw it as I was walking through, behind the bar, you usually see bottles or a mirror. In this case, you saw a miniature island diorama of a hut on raised logs with a, a resin sea and, uh, and, and sort of a, a fake sandy beach and palm trees they probably got from a model railroad shop. So it was this beautiful little island scene in miniature. And then behind it was a sky which changed from dawn to dusk. It had a lighting uh, change pattern on it. And it was just this fantasy Disney World environment that just mm. kind of, I really took to it. And when we got into the dining room, the dining room was even more um, amazing. It had an indoor waterfall and a lagoon and, uh, you know, aquariums and and fishing floats and and tiki's everywhere. Um, The waiters ordered into an intercom system that was built into the mouth of a tiki carving. 
they would, wow. when they took your order, they didn't write anything down. Um, they took your, took your order, no matter how many people were at the table. Sometimes when my grandparents were in from New York, there were six to eight of us on the table. Had it all in their head. They walked over to this big tiki god and they spoke into its mouth and <laughs> delivered the order to the kitchen. Um, so this place was my church. It was, I just loved it um, to the point where uh, even though it was a, you know, mid 20th century Americanized version of Polynesia and it was a little, you know, fantasy environment, it actually drove me to the real Polynesia. It's made me interested in genuine oceanic art and in actually visiting the islands. And when I got old enough to drink, I wanted, of course, to go to drink to these places. Uh, I was I legally was able to drink in 1980, I believe. And one of the first places I went to was the Tiki Tea in Los Angeles, yep. which had been there since 1961. And the drinks were amazing. The drinks were basically culinary craft cocktails, you know, 20 years before that term was ever coined. They were using fresh citrus. They made their own syrups. Um, they were using premium rums, very carefully mixed together. And these drinks blew my mind. And when I went to non-tiki restaurants, when I actually started making enough money to go to real restaurants, like a nice um, steakhouse or, uh, you know, Musso and Frank's or someplace, mm. you know, some really nice restaurant with high prices, captains as well as waiters, um, the drinks were terrible. Yeah. yeah. The drinks were god awful. This was the dark ages of the cocktail right. in the 1980s. Absolutely. Yes. yes. It, it, it was... Everything was made crappy. Everything was made with uh, bottled premixes or the industrial food complex had totally taken over. I remember going to one really fancy restaurant. Fortunately, I wasn't paying um, where I asked for a martini. I figured, well, I'm safe asking for a martini. I didn't think to specify gin or vodka. I just thought martinis were made with gin. So the bartender poured uh, vodka into a shaker and added ice and shook it. So I basically got shaken vodka poured into a martini. <laughs> No vermouth, no vermouth, yeah. like that. And this was yeah. a place that was you drop one hundred and fifty, sixty dollars, yeah, for your entree in the eighties, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, that's th any place else you went. If you ordered an old fashioned um, or a sidecar, you would get it frozen. You'd get a slushy drink. Everything was put into a blender and made slushy, uh, no matter what. I first thought a daiquiri came in a hurricane glass, like the one you've got, yes. um, with, a, right. with whipped cream right. on top of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and they're always strawberries, whether you ask for them or not. You know, old, that's what I thought. Old, fa old fashions too? Slushy old fashions? Oh, absolutely. No Just kidding. about everything. You know, And um, uh, I remember the shock when I first found out that a daiquiri was supposed to be served in a coupe glass. <laughs> shaking mm. the straight. Yeah. You know? It was like, what's this? So yeah. anyway, getting back to the thing, that the, the only drinks that really made me want to have another one or to go out at all and drink were, were tropical drinks made in the places that ever since the, um, you know, the, the end of prohibition ever since repeal have been making these drinks the same way. They didn't change. Yeah. Tiki cocktails were in the forefront of the fresh cocktail movement. Really? Yeah. It's, they it's, were the it's forerunners. You guys probably, I'm sure, you know, Camper English, the yeah, Spanish Yes, Wars. very well. Very he was, well. he kind of, um, opened my eyes when he said that if it wasn't for prohibition, we probably wouldn't have tiki drinks. Um, you know, there was, tw what was it, 12 years of devolution where every decent bartender left the country. They went to Venice, they went to London, they went to Cuba. Yes, now. exactly. Um, yes. Or they became soda jerks or shoe salesmen and mixology was dead, you know, and the one thing that filled the void were these tropical it's drinks. And, and there was, and the influx of the, of that culture um, coming in after World War II. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, as well, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that gave it its second act. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that would be the second act because the first act was really in, uh, in well, late uh, in the 30s, 30s, in the mid-30s. Mid yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, I can't help but um, distinguish the and notice the similarities between your career and that of Don the Beach um, in, in that I think where you, I think right. dad was about to say the same thing in that. That's right. It seems right. you both were part of the Hollywood scene. Is that is that an accurate assessment? Um, yeah, in different ways. Um, but, but see, Don was an innovator. I'm just an imitator. Um, uh, I, I don't know. know. No, no. But no, Don, no, but no. Don was it? You are the real Hollywood. Don was involved in consulting for set designers. I think that's but, what he wanted people to think. He did you, do that a little bit, but basically he was a bootlegger. But he you a are were a director and a scriptwriter. Writer, and director, very much yeah. 
ensconced in the Hollywood yeah. scene. If I was better at it, I probably wouldn't be talking to you right now. <laughs> if we were better at right. a lot of things, we would not be talking yeah. to you. This, right. was, my, this right. was my second act, you know, but um, but yeah, that's it, it's funny you should mention that because I should contextualize this. When in the eighties, when I first started drinking these drinks, I had no ambitions toward mm-hmm. anything other than being a bar fly. I mean, I, this yeah. was my recreation. I was trying to be, make it in the movie business, and this is just where I went to drink. I liked these drinks. I mean, I liked the uh, the atmosphere of Polynesian themed restaurants. Uh, it, I, I didn't want to be Don the Beachcomber or Trader Vic. I'd never had any uh, thought of that until the movie career went south. And in the meantime, I'd gone down this rabbit hole of trying to find out more about these recipes. Um, the pivot point was sometime in the late 80s when all of the good places that were still making drinks properly started to go out of business. Um, you know, the, basically cocktails were dead, bars were dead, um, and especially the kind of bars that spent the kind of money on pour costs that tiki bars did. You yes. know, an average restaurant or bar would have a 10% pour cost in the drinks because they had a, a can of pina colada mix and, and, you know, white rum. Whereas a tiki bar's pour cost would be 25, 30% with all the ingredients, fresh ingredients yeah. and expensive ingredients are going to these drinks. So, so those places were all going, going under. And as, as all my watering holes started to disappear one by one, I, I slowly began to realize that if I wanted to keep drinking these drinks, I'd have to learn how to make them myself. And that's when I started researching all this stuff. Again, as a hobby, strictly amateur, strictly as a hobby, um, I was just trying to find out, okay, where are the recipes? How do I make these? And the only bar book back then, you guys could probably relate, was Mr. Boston, <laughs> yeah, which, I think which I think had nothing of any, yeah, nothing of any value. Right. Uh, and, um, you know, once Jim Meehan took over Mr. Boston, he changed it around. Um, it's now, pardon me one second. Oh, no, that's fine. that's fine. Well, I think this is a good time. We'll take a quick break and then we'll be right back. So we're over here trying Denison rum these days. It's delicious, Dad, isn't it? It sure is, John. But did you know that this is a rum brand whose very name is inspired by the Latin word dentus, meaning... From within. Yes, I actually knew that. And it's commonly used to describe free-spirited people who travel the world in search of new experiences. Kind of like you, Dad. And Denizen Rum does just that by sourcing and blending unique small batch rums from throughout the Caribbean to create richer, more distinctive rums layered in character and flavor. I love the tropical fruit notes in this rum, don't you? I sure do, John. Well, let's get back to the show. And now we're back. (laughs) (laughs) Back again with Jeff Beach Bumberry. Yes, you were you were saying that uh, Mr. Boston, um, Jim Meehan took it over, and then and then he handed yeah, the reins over to me. <laughs> yeah, and then and then you between you and and Jim, you know, Jonathan and Jim, the two Jays, you guys reinvented Mr. Boston, and now it's um it's a very valuable reference, and we have it behind our bar, of yeah, course, with your yeah. names with your name on it and his name on it. But um, but, but back you, then you, it was just a. a Utterly useless, and oh, it, was it was the only. It was crap. Book out there. It was crap. Yeah. I'm sorry to say. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, that's why they needed you. you know? So, anyway, um, and they were smart enough to hire you, which is you know, good for them. So, I had to go to the. There were no books in print, so I went to used bookstores and I looked for older books that might have recipes. And right. I was coming up just snake eyes. I mean, I would buy, I would get old books like the Esquire Bar Guide, which was published in like '56 mm-hmm. or something like that, and look at the recipes in there and there was nothing and they had zombie recipes, but they were all crap. Um, they were just undrinkable. Every drink I made was terrible. It didn't taste, nothing lined up with what I was getting at these bars. Yeah. Um, and incidentally, when I started asking these old timers, what was in a drink, they would say the same thing. Rum and fruit juice. Yeah. You know, they, 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 this was, I began to realize that this was intellectual property. This was valuable uh, industrial secrets. These guys were keeping. Sure. Um, sure. And they did it out of habit. Um, right. Because back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, if you knew these recipes, that was your passport to employment. I mean, the the, um, the tiki craze was so huge and so many restaurants wanted to jump on the bandwagon that had no idea how to make the drinks because the recipes were kept secret among the, this fraternity of bartenders. I say fraternity because it was all very sexist back then. Um, anyway, uh, they would carry these recipes around in a little, in little, literally little black books. 
the size of a little tele address book in their shirt pocket. And I talked to one guy who worked at the Lua restaurant in 1956, and he got hired, a Filipino guy was hired as a dishwasher there. Um, he was a UCLA student. And that it took six months for him to get the recipes when he was being trained as a bartender. His uncle, uh, Vincent Pojas, uh, wouldn't give him the recipes. He wouldn't give his nephew the recipes. He says, no, no, I don't trust you yet. You haven't been here long enough. You know? um, and they, even in you know, 1995, 2000, these guys would not part with it. Even though there was no market for them anymore, it was just force of habit. You know? Right. Um, so, so that was it getting, it was a dead end talking to these people. It was a dead end going to use bookstores. It was a dead end going to the library. I would look up old magazine articles. Um, back then they still had something called the periodic index mm. where you would, um, they had these big books with, uh, index magazine articles from like 1935 to 40, 50. And you would look up, say, Don, the beachcomber, see what articles were written about him. Then you go into what, into the stacks. This is all digital now. I mean, it, uh, um, but, uh, you know, bygone age. These but, were the days of microfilm and microfiche. And, absolutely. Uh, microfilm was another thing I had to deal with. Yeah. 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 That was, boy, that was fun. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, long story short, <clears throat> I wasn't getting much of anything. And finally, in a used bookstore, I discovered this book called uh, Trader Vic's Bartending Guide that was printed in 1971-72. And at this point, Trader Vic was on the verge of retiring and he had nothing left to lose by keeping his recipe secret. And he had to keep content out there because at, at this point, he was kind of the Gordon Ramsay of his day. He was one of the first celebrity chefs. Yeah. Um, yes. Had a slew of cookbooks and drink books and uh, all of, you know, all of which were done before the mid 70s. Um, so he published uh, most of his famous recipes, the Fog Cutter, the, the Mai Tai, um, the Navy Grog, uh, Scorpion, all of these famous drinks from his restaurant, he, he published them and I tried them and oh, this is the real thing. Cause I could go to Trader Vic's in Beverly Hills with this book in my hand, order a fog cutter, drink it and look at the recipe and figure out mm. how to do these drinks. I, I, I didn't even know how to boil water. I was not a mixologist by any means, <laughs> strictly amateur, but, so, but I learned by being able to do that. So like reconstruct, um, reconstructing them. Right, right. And then I would go home and try my hand at, yeah. at other things. Now, even, the Navy Grog in Vic's book said three ounces of Trader Vic's Navy Grog rum and two ounces of Trader Vic's Navy Grog mix. That was the recipe right, in his the, book. Right, he wasn't going to put that up. So even when he spilled all his beans, he still held some things back. Of course, of course. Um, so, but the mother load wasn't just Trader Vic, because Trader Vic imitated Don the Beachcomber, who I'm sure we're going to end up talking about, who single handedly invented the tiki bar and what we now call the tiki drink. Um, in 1934, when he opened up Don's Beach Cafe yeah. and introduced what he called his rum rhapsodies to the world. Mm -hmm. um, he's the guy who invented the zombie. He invented the Navy Grog, which Trader Vic did his own version of. Uh, invented the Missionary's Downfall, the Rum Barrel, Pearl Diver, on and on, everything. Yeah. And his menu. Of and about maybe the Mai Tai. And maybe, according to him, the Mai Tai. Mm -hmm. So, so. When he hit it big, when when movie stars and CEOs, and, you know, Howard Hughes was a fan, when all these people started flocking to his little 40-seat bar, it became the toast of Hollywood, kind of the Spago of its day. Yeah. Even though Spago's an old, all my references are out of date. <laughs> I, but, uh, but anyway. Um, yeah, that's okay. That's okay. Most people don't know what the hell we talk about anyway. Oh, good. Okay. Well, I'm a good yeah, company. So, that's fine. So, so, but that's what Google's for. Yeah. Um, so he had this hugely popular place uh, and radio comedians and travel writers um, would all write about Don the Beachcomber's bar. And it was largely because of the zombie, which was the cosmopolitan of its day. Um, it was usually famous and largely because he was a very shrewd marketer. He marketed the drink as only two to a customer. This drink right. is so strong that we cannot serve more than two. So, all, so in the 1930s, a two-fisted, red-blooded, American male who wouldn't be caught dead drinking a frou frou drink with a with a nice garnish and uh you know and served in a, a tall glass you know a slug of whiskey um, or maybe a martini if you were a um, you know white collar toff but as far as these kind of like fancy drinks goes no no man wanted to touch those they still are like that sometimes uh, but he issued a challenge I dare you to climb Macho Mountain just order two of these and see if you can convince us to sell you a third. 
And it, it was great. It worked like a charm. It was also a punch in the face of the anti-saloon league. Remember, Prohibition had just ended. Mm-hmm. Repeal was being celebrated. And here was a drink with five ounces yeah. of rum in it. It was, a sl- um, yeah, it was like a slap yeah. in the face. Yeah. So, so take that, you know, yeah. all of you detailers, you know. So uh, it became, it went viral, as, as they say now. And travel writers would say, the first thing you have to do when you take the train into Union Station in Los Angeles is get a cab to Don the Beachcomber's and order a zombie. So naturally, everybody wanted to cash in on this. And within three years, there were 150 imitators of Don the Beachcomber's from coast to coast, including a chain called Monty Prozer's Beachcomber in, in New York, yes. on yes. Broadway, yes. Uh, which later became the Hawaii Kai. Which Hawaii Kai. Exactly. Um, so who... And Don all of a sudden found himself suing all these people um, for ripping him off. And they ended up changing his name slightly. For example, the missionary's downfall in order not to get sued by Don, a place here in New Orleans, the Bali High called their drink the Padres Pitfall. <laughs> so he just changed the name a little bit. Um, the Dr. Funk became the Dr. Fong, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So Don was on the warpath. And the reason that people were a- even able to serve his drinks anywhere else was by stealing his bartenders by offering them $15 more a week. Hey, come over across the street and serve these recipes Mm -hmm. at my bar. And then I can make, I can cash in on this Polynesian craze. So Don put a stop to that by putting his recipes in code. Instead of saying cinnamon syrup, Don's spice is number four. Don's dash is number one through eight. Don's mix, all of these things. And that's when I finally got a hold of, of one of these top secret, never before published on the Beachcomber recipe booklets from the daughter of a, a deceased mm-hmm. beachcomber bartender, it was it was in code. I couldn't make any of the drinks that I wanted to make. I couldn't make a real zombie. <laughs> I couldn't make a new new or any of these other things. Um, so he did that. And the reason he did that was, Jonathan, you're working at Don the Beachcombers and the Seven Seas uh, across the street wants to serve these drinks and cash in. So they say, uh, Mr. Pogash, come over here. We'll pay you. You're getting $35 a week now. We'll pay you 50. Come over here and make these drinks. And you go, Okay, sure, yeah, I'll do that. So you go over there, you go behind the bar, and you're going to make a nui nui, and you you have the recipe, and you go, where's your number two? Where's your number four? That's what the labels were. Right. Uh, and you were stumped, and this worked really well. It kind of stopped the flow for a little bit, but the cat was still out of the bag. There were enough people out there who were, who were you know, sort of like giving the recipes away to other people, and it, they started to spread. Um and then the bartenders themselves started keeping them top secret because they realized, like you did, Jonathan, when you got that extra 15 bucks, that I can go anywhere I want. Yeah. Uh, and the deal that a lot of these bartenders made, I talked to one guy um, who told me, it was Bob Esmina, a uh, Filipino guy who worked at the Contiki mm-hmm. chain. He said, yep. yeah, you, if you knew these recipes, you could go uh, to a, a restaurant that wanted to serve these drinks and, and say to the GM, all right, I'll make these drinks for you. You can name them whatever you want and, and put, you know, put them in a nice little menu and everything. Uh, all the menus were really beautiful. That, I think you have some there, Jonathan, that, uh, you know, full color illustrations of the drinks. I, I do back here, yeah. Yeah, they were beautiful sales tools. Yes. Um, you can do that, um, yeah, but I'm not going to tell you what the recipes are. I'll tell you what to order. You know, I'll tell you what to order from the purveyors and from the liquor distributors. Um, but if I don't like it here or if, you're, if, you know, or if I get a better offer somewhere else, I'm going to leave and I'm going to take the recipes with me. And that's what they did. And they had like throughout this 40 year tiki craze, they had guaranteed employment um, and they could keep going up the financial ladder yeah. until some of them opened their own places with these recipes that they kept so close to their chest, like which is what happened at the Tiki Tea. Um, so. I was discovering all this slowly. All these mysteries are being unraveled to me as I was trying to figure out how to make these damn drinks just so I could drink them at home. My motives are purely selfish. Yeah. Um, and um, what happened, how I got into all this and how the reason we're talking today um, is that there was a, a comic book publisher up in San Jose, uh, Dan Vado, at a, um, he still does, uh, company called Slave Labor Graphics, SLG, and he published underground comics, uh, alternative comics like uh, Milk and Cheese and Johnny the Homicidal Maniac were his two biggest sellers. <laughs> uh, and as he was doing that up in San Jose, I was down in Los Angeles and I was, by the mid nineties, I was actually meeting other people who were into this stuff, uh, which this is before the internet. There are no yeah. Facebook groups for people who like Tiki. I thought I was the only person in the world who was into this. I thought I was the only cocktail geek in the world uh, until I met a guy 
through at a, through a, a friend at a party named Ted Haig, who mm-hmm. you you know, Doctor Cocktail. Yeah. Um, at the time, he was a Hollywood art director, uh, and it, like me, he was an amateur. He just liked cocktails. He liked researching vintage drinks. We got along fine because even though Ted is very competitive, um, we were into different things. He was into he was into pre prohibition classic cocktails, all the Jerry Tano stuff. Yeah. I was in the post-prohibition tropical drink. So yeah. we could go out and, uh, and, 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 you know, there would, there would be no mm-hmm. hoarding of information. No competition. Yeah. Right? No, right. Um, so I, okay. Now there are two people in the world who like this stuff. And mm-hmm. uh, gradually I started to meet more people to the point where I met a lot of people who were into tiki stuff, not necessarily the cocktails. They were into this sort of, it became a sort of an alternative thrift store subculture. Yeah, the lifestyle. <laughs> Yeah, people were buying Hawaiian shirts in thrift stores. They were buying Martin Denny Exotica records. Mm-hmm. They were buying tiki mugs. They had no idea where any of this stuff came from. It was like this vanished suburban culture from the fifties. But it was a uh, you know thrift shopping was the thing in the nineties, and everybody got their wardrobe and their furniture and their music and everything from thrift stores. Um, so I met people who were into tiki through that route. Uh, one of these guys would have he was a surfer. He would throw backyard luau's at his place in Venice, and he had me do the drinks since I was the only one who was interested in that. I, at this time, I had a few decent recipes, which I'd found in old magazines or books or, or Trader Vic's books. So I was the guy in charge of making the, you know, the trash can punch back in the, in the back of the uh, back of the house. And people would come up to me and say, how do you make this drink? So I did a little Xerox um, zine, uh, just by hand, no computers or anything like that, cutting and pasting. And I, some of my favorite recipes, I'd put them together and cut and paste and went to a a Xerox store, and um, I would give them out to people. I would say, how do you make this drink? Here, here's what I know. Mm-hmm. One of those found its way to Dan up at Slave Labor, and he said, hey, do you want to do a real book? And I said, okay. Again, this was a hobby. This was just for fun. He wants sure. to do a little booklet? Sure, why not? I mean, it's, I'm into this stuff. It sounds cool. So it was um, a little spiral-bound, super cheap uh, thing, uh, which we ended up calling the Grog Log, mm-hmm. and it had all the recipes I'd gathered to date. That was 1994. Well, I did the first zine version in 1994. The, the spiral bound version came out in 1998. Um, Dave, uh, Dan rather, had no, he didn't know how to do books. He wasn't a book guy, he was a comic book guy. So the only place you could get the Grog Log was in comic book stores. So we turned a lot of comic book nerds into tiki nerds. <laughs> Incredible, unbelievable. And, and I wanted to, I, I wanted to just fast forward a little bit um, because we just have a couple more minutes left. I know it just flies, it flies by. Um, I, I wanted to quickly talk about. Well, first of all, you, you mentioned your books, and and you have other books, uh, including well, uh, sipping, Safari. including this one, yeah, uh, yep, sipping Safari, Safari uh, Intoxica, yeah. Potions of the Caribbean. Um, but also, you are in New Orleans, and you have a bar, Latitude Twenty Nine. Yeah. Um, a, a, a long st- again, long story short, um, one book turned into five, six, seven books. Yeah. Um, and the movie career fell away, and I thought maybe I can make a living writing cocktail books. <laughs> 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 oh, no, if only I knew. So in the meantime, other people were profiting off these books. They were opening up tiki bars and were winning awards and making tons of money. And, and Mrs. Bum convinced me that we should open our own place and try and cash in on that. So we did. And it's been great. We've been open seven years. It's been a, a ton amazing. of fun. It, it's an amazing spot. It's an amazing Thank spot. Thank you. Steep learning curve for me. Because remember, I was a home a amateur home yeah. bartender. Yeah. Sure. Uh, it's just been, it's, I'm still learning every day. Um, <laughs> in addition to that, I now have, um, not to toot my own conch shell, but uh, we've got my we've got our own syrup line, Latitude 29 syrups, which are being sold through Orjat Works and Colorsar. We've got uh, Cocktail Kingdom put out a line of uh, Beach Berry Barware. Oh, and, amazing. Um, and, we, and I've got a rum now, uh, a zombie blend rum with uh-huh. Hamilton rums, um, uh-huh. so that you can only have to only have to pour one rum instead of three. Uh, that was something that I ripped off from Trader Vic. Remember yeah. his Navy Grog rum and all that. Um, so there's all kinds of tiki stuff going on and it's just, it's real now. And it's, it's kind of blows my mind. I mean, I'm still back in, you know, in the nineties when none of this seemed possible. It was just completely yeah. absurd to think of this. It's, well, it's been great. been a great ride. We are going to have to meet very soon at Latitude 29. Please. Well, I'm going, I'm going stir crazy. I haven't traveled in two and a half or every three single years episode, now. Dad mentions that he's stir so, crazy every single well, episode. And it's the second, second episode. Doing I've this mentioned. podcast, we've, we've hoped that he would become less 
stir crazy. Um, but it seems well, I have, he, he but has there's a little nothing, bit. There's nothing like travel. There's nothing like oh, New Orleans. You're, you're right. There's and nothing like Latitude 29. Well, hey, we'll you know, tales, tales is around the corner. Tales of the Cocktail happens yes. every July, and it's happening yes. in person at, in New Orleans. Um, and well, this year I'm going. Dad's going. Oh, fantastic. We'll, we'll see well, you. We, Hopefully we'll see I would, you. There. I would love to return the favor and host you the way you hosted us. In, oh, in I, I remember that brunch at Brennan's very well. I'm Jeff, still digesting it. Uh, <laughs> fondly. It was, we had a great time. Well, um. Thank you. Jeff Beach Bumberry, this has been great. Thank you so much for agreeing to be our guest. Oh, anytime. Thanks for having me. It was, it was Jeff, great, to, great to see you again, John. We're going we're gonna to have to do it again because there's so much more to talk anytime. about. Here's a little known fact. J.P. Weiser's is Canada's oldest continuously produced whiskey established in 1857. How about another nugget of info? It's award winning. I love this brand. Not only because its founder, John Philip, has the same initials as yours truly, but because it makes a delicious Canadian old fashioned. What's that, you ask? It's maple syrup, bitters, JP Weiser's, try it with the triple barrel rye or the 15 year. Yum! Check out jpweiser's.com and on Instagram at JP Weiser's Whiskey. That does it for today's show. If you enjoy what we do, please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. You can also support the show with a small monthly donation to help sustain future episodes. Just click on the donate button at the top of our website and choose your donation amount. To learn more about future guests, visit www.thecocktailgurupodcast.com or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. The Cocktail Guru Podcast is produced by First Real Entertainment and distributed by Eats Drinks TV, a service of the Center for Culinary Culture, home of the Cocktail Collection, and is available via Anchor, Spotify, Apple, Google, Amazon, and wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 